Um, okay, so today, like I said, we're going to cover identifying your skills, application, and portfolios. We also have uh, four more weeks of the Creative Job Search program uh, coming up. This happens every Tuesday, and in week three, we'll be talking about resumes, week four, social media, and LinkedIn. Um, the fifth week is the job interview, and then Robin joins us back on week six to do facing unemployment at 50 and older. Um, one of the questions we get quite often is, uh, will we receive this presentation? And yes, you will. And the follow-up material I will send you tomorrow. You will receive um, the presentation with all of the speaker notes, so you don't have to furiously write as you are watching this. You will also receive some additional material, um, some kind of worksheets to help you identify your skills, and a link to a recording of today's session so that you can view it again if there's some pieces you missed or needed clarification on. All right, so why identifying your skills? Why is this so important? I, I happen to believe this is the most important thing in job search. Uh, the reason is everything revolves around this. When you write your resume, when you take part in an interview, unless you've identified your skills, you really don't have a plan, uh, a marketing plan. And that's what job search is all about. It's marketing yourself to employers. We are not marketing our job history necessarily. We're marketing what we did within that job history. Uh, for many years, I've seen off and on um, resumes pop into my inbox of um, just names and dates. You know, I was at this location for five years, and then I was at this location for the next four years. And that's certainly important to job search. Employers want to know that you have a work history. But what's more important is once you've developed or gotten their interest is what you did during that job history. Uh, so anyways, that's what we're going to cover today. So pop quiz. Some of these I'll ask for some feedback. Some of them I'll give you. Uh, the first one I'll give you, what is a skill? And a skill is anything you can do well, you know, what you can do well. Um, not everything we can do well is related to job search, but it is a skill. So in the chat box, if you could just give me a number, how many skills do you think the average person has? There's no wrong answer for this. Just put in into the chat box what you think the average number of skills a person might have. And we always do get a wild variety of answers. Um, I've had people say three. I've had people say five. Um, the actual answer, I'll just give you a couple more seconds to put in here. Maybe five to six, 30 to 40, 50, 35. Um, the average person has 500 to 800. And I do get some pushback on that because many people will say, well, that's, you know, simple things. Uh, those are, you know, how could you possibly have 500 or 800 actual skills? When we break down what we do, we understand that many of the things we consider a skill is just a title. Uh, an example could be something like welding. Uh, if I were an experienced welder, I may say my skill is in welding. However, there are probably 50 skills involved in that. There are 50 different classifications. You have MIG, you have TIG, you have cast iron, aluminum, um, you know, running a plasma cutter, um, getting the right mixture on a settling torch. I'm not a welder, um, so I'm not going to embarrass myself and, and pretend that I am. However, breaking down what you do into component skill sets give you marketable pieces of information that could relate to a new opportunity. The reason this is important, the reason I, I talk about this is the average person can identify 10 skills. When we have 500 to 800, we can market or talk about 10, and that's leaving a lot off the table. So it's really important for this reason. The percentage of people who cannot identify, sell, or prove their skills during an interview is 80%. Now, the reason I use that figure, think about I mean, this, this is independent of the example I'm going to give you, but think about an average interview that you go on. Um, now, you may be the only person interviewed. That would be silly, but that happens. Uh, you could be one of two. You could be one of ten. The average is about five. At least when I conduct an interview uh, process, I'll have five candidates come in if I can get five candidates. And at that point, they're all, they all have a chance. Let's just say that. I mean, I know in some situations someone will have, you know, pre-existing relationship that gives them a better chance. 
I get that. But we have no control over that. So let's just say at five people, they all have an equal chance of getting the job. That means the success rate of any one person getting that job is 20%. The failure rate or non-success rate, if we're going to use a, a uh, more positive term, is 80%. If everyone came in from an equal opportunity and only one person got the job because there was only one person or only one job available, the people who didn't get the job, usually it's because they did not effectively market their skills to this position. So that's why it's so important. Um, there are a lot of important things in job search, but if you cannot market what you have to offer, they're not going to buy it. Um, and then that's sad because in many cases, a lot of people leave things off the table. They didn't consider. Um, they, they play Monday morning quarterback. Oh, if I just told them about that five years that I volunteered for that nonprofit in which I did fundraising, oh, that would have been great. So when you start your job search, it shouldn't start with a blank word processing document and typing in a resume. It should, should, should start with a blank piece of paper and put skills at the top and just start throwing everything at, there, everything at it. Now, I get it, there are some skills that seem a little silly to put on there, but at this stage, you're not showing it to anybody. So if you're really good at splitting wood or riding a unicycle or whatever, ah, put it on there. Um, it, it seems kind of silly, but you want to put all of the knowledge that you could offer anybody, and then we filter that down to what knowledge we could offer a specific audience. And at that point, it's not 500 to 800. It, it can get down to 20 skills, but it will still be more than you started with. Um, so, how do we develop skills? This is one of those multiple choice questions that always ends in the all of the above, but I like to show it because the most important is the first one. Employers find more value in skills developed through work experience than anything else. That does not mean that's the only thing you can use. If an employer is looking for the example I gave, fundraising experience. I have zero fundraising experience through my work history, but I do have fundraising, extensive fundraising experience through sports or through volunteer work. So if they require that, it'd be great if I could give them work history. Uh, I can't, but I'm still going to give them the skill because I still possess it. Um, so you can jump into any part of your life to bring out skills. However, if you have them in multiple situations, use the most relevant, which in this case would, for me would, be, uh, would not be work experience, but it, it would hopefully be in most of the jobs that you are applying for that you feel highly qualified for. All right. So this is not obvious to most people. It seems like a question you could possibly even ask a large audience, and that is what types of skills are most important to job search. Soft skills. Soft skills are the most important, especially at interview. Remember when I said that if I interview five people, they all have a shot at the job, hopefully. Okay? So why am I going to hire any one person? Well, because they're going to talk about their skills, their relevant skills. But what questions will I ask to bring that out? Have you been, ever been asked a question? And you can just put a yes or no in the, in the chat box. Um, have you ever been asked a question similar to, Give me a situation in which you had a disagreement with a coworker, and how did you handle that? Just a yes or a no, something similar. Wow, some fast yeses. Oh, one no. That's, thank you for your honesty. A lot of yeses. Now, think about that. That's probably not in the job description. Uh, it might be. You know, conflict resolution might be. But that's definitely a soft skill, and it's important to every single position you have. I can train someone who is qualified to do the job for me. Um, my willingness to do that depends on how I see them as fitting in, adapting, and learning. By the way, fitting in, I don't, do not mean that you have to be exactly like your coworkers. You do not have to be. You just have to be someone who is willing to do the job and contribute and work in a team environment. And everyone brings a wide variety of skills, ideas, um, experiences to a job. And that's perfectly okay in every position. The, the fitting in means is, are you going to attempt to get along with customers, with coworkers, 
Um, and this is a really important one. I try to add this to every single interview I partake in because one of the biggest issues with people who have a lot of experience is that they will think that they know how to do it already. And then when you know an employer says, well, this is how we do it, that means you're gonna have to adapt or learn an additional way to do something that maybe you already thought you knew how to do. And so I always add a story of how I um, adapted to a new process or um, learned a new computer program that I wasn't used to, because most people don't want to do that. And I get a lot of stories around, oh, the other computer program we used was so much easier, or the other process we had for this was so much easier. And of course it was, because everyone was used to it. Being able to adapt and learn says to an employer, I understand that change is going to happen no matter what, I'm gonna make the best of it, and I understand that we're doing this for a reason. So those are some things to consider um, how you wanna present yourself in an interview, and it's all about skills. All right, so how, before we go uh, pause for our first um, couple questions here, how does identifying your skills help you in the job search? And I know that would be a long question to ask, um, so I'm not going to ask you to type it in. The idea is it's the center of everything. It's the center of proving your abilities to potential employers. Once you've identified a skill, now you can create a statement that defines that skill, to what level you've done that skill. It's an accomplishment statement. I'll show you an example coming up, um, but if you haven't identified the skill, you can't attempt to define that skill. It, of course, helps you to write your resume and complete applications. We'll be talking about applications today. Resumes are next week. Um, but also, it helps you to sell your qualifications in an interview. Um, I think the soft skills are used more in an interview um, than they would be on the application, than they would be on the resume. Even though they're important on all three facets, in an interview, you're asked a lot of questions about soft skills. In fact, I would think nearly 50% of the questions you're going to be asked are not about how do you weld, how do you do this. That's why I'm interviewing you, because you've proven to me on your resume, on your application, that you have that experience. Now I want to see if I want to work with you, whether you're trainable, whether you'll adapt, whether you'll learn, whether you'll get along. So I'm going to ask about those soft skills. Most people don't even consider soft skills when they're preparing for a job hunt, the, the job hunt. So think about what you're good at. Um, think about what you could do to improve some things that you're not so good at. And by the way, everyone can improve while they're job seeking. One of the things that we offer right now, and I'll be sending everyone information on this, is the Coursera courses that are available through the state of Minnesota. Um, in the chat box, if you've taken a Coursera course or have heard about it, could you, um, oh, thank you, Heidi. Uh, someone immediately said those are amazing, and I agree. Um, there are tons of courses that soft skills, hard skills, job seeking skills, they are incredible, and they're absolutely free, so they're not a sales pitch. Um, you can register by the end of this year uh, we set you up with an account and you have access to like 3,800 courses. Um, I'll give you an example of how those could be used. Let's say that um, one of the things that you've got everything you need for a job, but it requires something called SQL or SQL. Um, and if you've never heard of that, that's perfectly fine, but I'm just giving you an example. And you've never done that in a work situation. You could take that course and now you could say to an employer, while I don't have it in work history, it is in my education because I just took this course and received a certificate. It's better than not putting it on your resume at all. Of course, it'd be awesome if you had five years of experience with it, but now you can at least bring it up. And you can say to an employer, while I've been unemployed, here's the skills that I've been enhancing. And employers are looking for that now more than ever before. One of the questions we get quite a bit is, my gosh, I've been out of work for four months. I've never had this issue. Um, and as an employer even going to consider me, Yes, absolutely, more than ever before, simply because a lot of people are in that same situation. The opportunity here is to separate yourself from other job seekers that have been, you know, not knowing what to do, haven't been able to find work, or haven't been comfortable, you know, re-engaging in, in, in job search. If you have been someone who during this time has been actively seeking opportunities to increase your skills, that tells an employer that you're very dedicated to your career. 
and I would much rather take someone on in that situation than someone who couldn't tell me what they were doing during the past four months, six months. All right, this time we're going to stop for just a couple questions. Uh, Robin, are there anything that has come into the chat box? Okay, Art, I'm going to put you on the spot. All right. <laughs> So nobody's asked a question yet, just because I think they're listening really, really intensely right now. And by the way, I put the URL for Coursera up there in the chat box. So while I am asking Art my question, I'd uh, love it if you guys throw in your questions as well and, and we'll collect them. Okay, so Art, you've been talking about soft skills and the importance of them. Now, when I work in my over 50 class, I find that a lot of experienced workers in particular tend to forget to promote soft skills because they just come so naturally. You know what I mean? They just do them. So my question to you is, in your experience, what is an example of a skill? It doesn't have to be the biggest, but what is an example of a skill that you find people tend to forget they have or forget to promote? So uh, one of the big ones that you could, um, you could talk about is conflict resolution. And, and very few people will, will you know, um, calming people down <laughs> or um, looking for positive results to the situation as opposed to a win-lose situation. You now, if you look at a situation as what benefits this relationship as opposed to how do I win and this person lose, that's a huge, huge skill set and, and many people come by it naturally. If you've been working 30, 40, 50 years in your career, the reason you've worked that long is because you have the soft skills that allow you to um, work with a wide variety of people in, in a job situation. Thinking about what has made you effective in that situation is your soft skills. Um, so you're absolutely right, Robin, in that most of us forget or don't realize what we do quite naturally. So one of the things I look at is, if you, if you should keep every one of these, by the way, look at your reviews, your yearly reviews. Think about when someone has given you a thank you, it, whether it's a customer, whether it's uh, a coworker, why did they thank you? What was the reason for that? What was the skill you exhibited that led them to find value in that? And that becomes the proof of what you can offer. Um, it's not easy, and that's why it's important to do it now as opposed to when you find yourself being asked these questions in an interview and then trying to develop them on the spot. All right. Um, we can tell, it looks like a couple of questions have come in. Robin, they there... have indeed. Here's a really super quick one. Um, is problem solving considered a soft skill art? Um, I believe so. Um, I think so too. Yeah, I, um, yes, exactly. Uh, it, it is a soft skill because it's, it's looking at a situation and breaking it down and figuring out, you know, what steps need to be taken. This organization is actually a huge part of problem solving. Analytical thinking is part of it, too. Um, the, the caution I will give you, though, it's not just knowing the terms, because you can look up, you can Google, you know, um, soft skills, and you'll get a whole list of them. It's providing examples. So if it's something you truly believe you possess, then, then give me an example of how you've exhibited that. Because if you don't, it's just a word, and it may be a keyword, I get that. There are people put keywords on resumes because they're in the job description. But at some point, I want you to prove that. And it's very obvious in an interview when someone wrote something down just to get that, that, uh, that match. Um, and honestly, if they can't prove it in an interview, it's actually worse that they put it down because now I feel like they were trying to game the system a little bit. I am, so, I am so glad you said that, Art. <laughs> My particular bugaboo is people who say they have communication skills and then don't give me any information <laughs> or examples of specifically the communication skills they're talking about. Okay, one more question, and then I'm, there, there's some good ones coming in, so I'm grabbing them, guys. We're going to wait. We're going to let Art decide when he wants to, to nab them. But here's one. Um, is it possible for you to maybe oversell yourself out of a potential job? Yeah, you can, because you can speak to skills that are not needed. Um, it's okay to keep them in your back pocket. Um, I always try to think of value-added skills, um, but you always want to speak to the needs of the position. The value-added skills are those other things that you've identified, but you don't necessarily put in your resume or your application because they're not requested. There are some times when there are some, some skills you could anticipate that would be a, a value and you could add them, but you don't want to give them everything. 
especially if you are concerned about the, the potential of being overqualified for a job. In many cases, people who are overqualified are just not as specifically marketed as they needed to be. They're, we're so proud of what we do because, honestly, think about it. We spend more time at work than we do with our family. It's a huge part of what we are, how we identify ourselves. And it's very difficult to go from a job up here to a job that's more entry level when you're maybe restarting your career. So we tend to talk about things that aren't relevant. And in that case, an employer doesn't see the value and they think of someone who is potentially, you know, just here for a short period of time until a job that they would find valuable appears and they leave. And the cost for an employer is immense in that because they have to go through all the paperwork and the interviews and then the training without return on investment. So yes, you don't want to oversell yourself, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about let's get it all on a piece of paper so we know what we can draw from. It's a pool of skills to draw from, but you don't need to put them all on every application, on all, every resume. Your job posting that you are, are responding to will dictate what you need to, to market about yourself. All right, um, I got a Venn diagram here that just, just an, an easy way of, of showing the three types of skills that are, are out there. Um, we talked about soft skills. The job skills are specific to an industry, and, and the example I gave was, was welding. The mistake a lot of people make is they think, because I'm a welder and because I'm applying to a job for welders, they're going to know. They're just going to know. Anyone in that industry would know that in order to have this, you have to have this, 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 and this. Not necessarily. And the reason I say that is at application, especially at application, you are not dealing with someone who knows what you know. You are dealing with someone who has a job description and maybe an HR representative, what we used to call personnel representative. Um, <laughs> so don't assume everyone knows what it takes to get to the level you're at. You don't want to speak down to the position, obviously, but you don't want to assume things either. So I've had a lot of people that just leave a lot off the table because they say, you know what, in that industry, they're just going to know all that. In some cases, that's absolutely true. But in other cases, look very closely at that job description and, and consider how is this written? Is this written from a standpoint of someone with 20 years of experience in the field? Or is this written from a standpoint of here's exactly what you need and do I need to respond to each of those? The, the one you really want to look for in your current job search, and this is any time you are transferring from one industry to another or one employer to another, is the transferable skills. These are used in many different jobs. So organizational skills, um, a lot of the soft skills are transferable. Customer service is, is the most transferable skill, uh, I believe, in that every job requires it. Every job you have has a customer, whether that's an internal customer, which would be your uh, fellow employees that maybe you do work for them or they do work for you. So you know, you're in their outbox, they're in your inbox, however that works. Um, or the more traditional um, external customers in, in which you sell goods and services to. People with excellent customer service skills generally are the easiest people to employ because of the soft skills, because employers looking for those soft skills, customer service is one of the most important. I don't know if I phrased that exactly right, but the idea here is think about not just technical skills, not just soft skills, but what you've done in relation to what is needed, does that make it a transferable skill? So sometimes it's taking it into the component parts. I'm going to give you a quick example of this. Um, so in the, in, for many years, um, when people, you know, I meet people at a reunion or, or whatever, and they would say, well, Art, what have you been doing for the last 20 years? And I would say, well, I'm a trainer. Um, that, that's what I've been doing. I, I, I love training. And I found out how silly it was to say that. Uh, a few years later when someone called me, and this is someone I knew personally but was calling me for a work matter, and they had said, Art, I need your help. I said, great, happy to help. What can I do for you? And he said, um, I need to lose some weight. And I thought, oh, my gosh. Uh, at that time, we didn't have all the apps and, and all the calorie counting apps, so um, Excel was one of my skills. So I said, you know, do you want me to create a, a calorie counter in Excel to help you track your whatever? He says, no, no, you're a trainer, right? He thought I was uh, like an aerobics instructor. And let me assure you, I am not. Um, but in his mind, that's what trainer meant. So he was looking for, 
here's a position, here's the transferable skill that did not transfer. I was not specific in describing my skills to my network. Where do we find most of our jobs? At least in some part through our network. So you need to define what's transferable from what you've done in the past to the type of work you want to do now. And that'll paint an image in people's mind on why you'd be relevant to that type of work. And then they can advocate for you if they have the opportunity. All right, so here's a, a quote as a lead-in to um, a little exercise that I'm going to show you. And that is from Bill Gates, he once said, my people have the confidence of their convictions and they know their skills. When you know what a person has to offer, they become more valuable to your organization. I mean, I'm sure it's happened to everybody at some point where your boss will come to you and said, Jane, you're really good at this, so could you take on this project? Now, you may say, I don't want to take on that project. However, that's job security. When you have value above and beyond what maybe just the specific job description is, you can do that job, and that's fine, but so can everyone else. What can you do to add value to that position? And that does not mean you have to volunteer for everything. But if you let people know what your skills are, and hopefully what you like to do within the you know, parameters of what might possibly be relevant to a position, they have the opportunity to utilize that. And the more you're utilized in those, in those, um, those duties, the more secure your job becomes. Uh, I think it's very important uh, to, to identify your skills and then as relevant, let your employer, let your coworkers know. So how do you do that? One of the follow-up material uh, items I'm going to send everybody is a skills identification activity. And it looks just like this. I, I really do recommend you do the work on this. Do a few of them. There's, I think there's, there's room for like five. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna take a job activity name. So in this case, I'm gonna use what I'm doing right now. So I'm gonna say, uh, a workshop on skills identification. So what did I have to do? What were the tasks involved in doing this activity? So that's breaking it down to its component parts. So thinking about, okay, I know this is really small, so I will, I'll read this out. First, create the presentation, schedule the session, market the class, invite participants, present the material, and then send a follow-up material. So those, I could say, I'm, I, you know, I'm putting on a workshop, well, there's a lot of parts to that workshop, so I'm breaking it down. Now I'm gonna think about what are the skills I utilize to do those activities. So curriculum development, knowledge of online databases, internet marketing, scheduling, public speaking. How many people enjoy public speaking? Some people do, um, some people are naturally good at it, some people can do it. Um, that's a value add to any job. Could you run a safety meeting for someone? for you know, a, a manufacturing plant. Um, those are things that are transferable skills. PowerPoint, WebEx, timeliness, all those things are potential skills that could be marketed within that overall activity. So think about all the things you do on a daily basis when you're working, and then try breaking them down into their activities and the skills used. So the whole idea of this is, okay, now what am I gonna do with that? In the resume class next week, we'll be talking about uh, accomplishment statements. So that's taking your skills and then putting together a phrase, a sentence, a bullet point that will kind of um, create a picture in the employer's mind of, of how that skill presents value. So in this case, um, I just put created, marketed, and presented an online workshop series for job seekers through the WebEx platform. I added a bunch of things there. Um, I, I use the um, active verbs, action verbs. Um, so I created, that's curriculum development, marketed, marketing is important in, in anything, presented, public speaking, online's real, real key right now. Now, if they were asking for some, uh, maybe they were asking for Zoom, I would say through an online platform because if I don't have Zoom knowledge, I don't wanna say I only know WebEx, so I'm gonna say through an online platform. So it creates the idea that I understand online platforms. Uh, I don't want to misrepresent myself of knowing specifically Zoom, but I want to say that I know the general idea. Now, if you have numbers to back that up, that's even better. That's the next step in accomplishment statement is taking those skills and then putting in appropriate numbers if relevant. Now, not all accomplishment statements have to have numbers, but in any grouping of accomplishment statements, let's say in the four to five bullet points you have after a job, there should be at least one figure, one percentage, one dollar sign, one number, 
and that attempts to prove or give scope to what you're talking about. All right, we'll pause for a couple of questions if there are any. Robin? Yeah, there sure are, Art. Um, so this is really interesting. So someone says, shouldn't we focus on unique skills? And then they go on to say, for example, you know, pretty much everybody has shown problem solving skills at some point. But if someone comes to you, Art, with a resume that just had problem solving on it, what would you encourage them to do? So what's unique about it is how you do it, your specific story. Um, I, I did an interview once and I, I listed a skill and oh, that was required. And, and I'm, not, I'm not making this up. All five people gave me the same story. They gave me the internet answer to, um, and I can't even remember what it was. Um, but I, I, the reason I can't remember what it was was I was so disgusted because none of the applicants took the time to tell me their unique story. I'm looking for the same skills from everybody from the job posting. How you separate yourself is those, um, your specific story. You're giving scope to it. So I could say provided excellent customer service in a retail environment, or I could say uh, served 100 to 200 clients per day um, while um, dealing with uh, tricky return, something like that. I mean, that's a bad example, but notice how I gave scope to it. How you separate yourself is you put in the work to make it yours. And the only way to do that is a lot of practice. Uh, one of the things we offer at CareerForce, we are closed physically in many of our locations, but we are open virtually. So, for example, if you were in the Brooklyn Park area and you had um, a resume and you were just like, ah, oh, man, I just don't know how to talk about my customer service. If you have a resume put together, we can help you make that resume better. You can call in or email that location. And by the way, I'm gonna give you the contact information of all 50 locations. Um, do your local one though. Don't call me in Duluth because I don't know your area unless you happen to be in Duluth and I could connect you to one of our uh, workforce development reps in this area. Uh, they're gonna give you specific local knowledge and they're gonna help you to flesh out those skill statements so they become unique to you. So I really like that question. Absolutely, you wanna make it unique, but you don't wanna make it unique outside of the requirements of the job. You wanna make it unique within the requirements of the job, but your special story. Now, could you add one or two value added unique points? Absolutely, but speak to the needs of the audience. Don't speak to what you're proud of. And, I, and I've seen resumes like that. I, I look at them, I look at the job posting, I don't understand what they're talking about. And I, I realize what they're talking about, their resume is what they're proud of. And that does not market your, you necessarily to the needs of the employer. Uh, we can take one more here, Robin. Ah, perfect timing, Art, because the next question has to do with the needs of the employer. Okay. So what happens if the employer maybe isn't communicating those needs real well? The question is sometimes job postings are very sketchy and it can yeah. be difficult to build your resume uh, and identify the needs. How do you do that? Yeah, you know, and by the way, this is what we used to deal with all the time. Uh, now it's less because uh, employers can ask for the moon because they're not charged per word in an internet uh, job posting. But still, some, there's just some standard, you know, job postings that an employer puts out. That's where your research comes in. That's where your networking comes in. Look at their, if it's not on the job posting, look at their, uh, their uh, website. Look at their mission statement if they have one. Look at who they serve. Look at the stories. Look about how they, they're, they're about us. I love the about us tab on, on even small companies have a great about us presence. And it talks about the history of, the, of that, that um, um, business. And that's where you can separate yourself because if you're only looking at the job posting that doesn't give you much, don't just say, ah, they, they, don't, they don't have anything for me to respond to, so I'm just gonna put on what I, you know, what I put on for everyone else. You can still get specific, it just takes a little bit more work. All right, we're gonna move on. And by the way, if you have, still have questions relating to this, you can certainly ask them and we will, we will get to as many as we can. We're gonna talk now about applications. Like I said, next week we talk specifically about resumes and I do get a lot of questions about if I fill out an application and then I put the same exact information on my resume, what's the point? I mean, many applicant tracking systems even allow you to upload your resume into the application. 
I'm going to caution you on that. It may allow you to do that, and, and, and I get it. That's fine. It saves you some time. Um, however, go through it with a fine-tooth comb. Go through everything that it tried to parse out into your employment history, into your objective, or what, if you, whatever you use, uh, because it doesn't work necessarily exactly the way it should. Also, think about the differences between an application, the purposes between an application and a resume. An application is a filtering device for an employer to find, you know, here's 100 applicants, I need five candidates. So they're looking for reasons to filter. So omitting keywords can screen out your applicant, uh, may screen you out. Um, not using your space wisely or leaving things blank in an application can screen you out. You are required to fill in everything they ask. Now, if you have questions about illegal questions or something like that, I, before you, you know, write in, I won't answer that or anything like that, I would reach out to us uh, at CareerForce because in many cases what we consider to be an, uh, an illegal question actually isn't. Employers are fairly savvy on what they can and cannot ask. If you have questions about that, um, it's a situational basis, you know, certainly reach out. Um, another thing is there are still some handwritten applications. I ran into one uh, last week in which someone had to fill out uh, an application by hand and they asked for help and, and they showed me it and it was all, you know, had some folds in it and some crinkles. First step, if you get a clean application that you fill out, put it in a folder, make a copy of it, fill out the copy, make all your edits, your cross outs, you know, type it into a word processor to spell check whatever you're putting in there and then copy off of the now edited version to a clean copy. Because when we look at an application or even a resume, the first thing we notice is, is it neat? Is it organized? Um, on an application, something as simple as something being blank it can get it thrown out. So make sure you follow the directions, be complete, be neat, be positive and honest. One of the hardest questions to answer on an, on an application is why did you leave your last job? If you haven't considered that question before you start writing it out, you may go with what I call the emotive response, how you emotionally feel about it, which is very seldom, if ever, the way you should write it down. Um, we'll talk about that in a couple of slides. But applications are, in many cases, not seen by the same people who interview you. And, and I was shocked by this the first four times it happened to me. Um, I, I'd be in an interview and, and they would ask a question um, about, you know, salary or whatever. And I would say, well, I did, you know, I did fill that out in the application. And almost dismissively, someone said, well, we don't see the applications. Even for medium-sized employers, sometimes the applications, that's just for the HR department. So the application and the resume need to stand on their own. I've had people say, you know, I don't need to put uh, my employment on my resume because that's all on the application. Well, can you imagine being handed a resume for someone you're going to interview and there being no employment on there whatsoever and you don't have the application to look at? That would be a bad first impression. Uh, now, if you have specific knowledge of someone's hiring practice and you happen to know that certain things happen or they look at both or whatever, you know, specific knowledge trumps any general knowledge. However, Overall, I would say, think of your application as a filtering device for an employer to get you to the interview, and a resume is your marketing piece to win you the job. Um, the problem with that is, in many cases, your resume is just an attachment to an application. So I would really challenge you, as you're creating your resumes, as you're giving your specific skills, don't let it just sit as an attachment to an application. Think of it as a marketing tool for your friends, your family, your former coworkers, sending it to your references to update them on what you've been doing. Um, there's a lot of things you can do with the resume that don't entail it sitting as an attachment to an application. Um, even cold calling, you know, even stopping into a business. By the way, that can be done. I realize it's less likely to be done now, but I've had some very, very dedicated job seekers with masks, with social distancing, walk into an employer and introduce themselves. And they have their resume. Um, and they drop it off if they'll take it. They hear no a lot, uh, but the one yes is all you really need in many cases. Um, I've had people get on the spot interviews by doing that. So something to think about. All right, so here's a quick little test. Now, if you've seen this before, and I've used this a couple times in, in various workshops, uh, you don't need to participate. But if this is the first time you've seen this, 
I will tell you that there are no, um, there's no tricks here. All I'm asking you to do is I want you to count the number of Fs, F as in Frank, that you see in just these four lines. So not the top, not the bottom, just read through it and for 10 or 15 seconds, and then in the chat box, put the number representing the number of Fs you can identify. Okay, I see a lot of answers coming through. Uh, none of them are right yet. Oh, there we go. We're getting, we're getting some. We got some threes, some fours, some fives, some sixes, or a six. A lot of threes. Now, when you, when you look at that, and you're seeing them come through the chat box, that may, like, give you pause. Like, how could we all be looking at the same thing, been given this very simple instruction, and come up with different answers? Because, like I said, there's no trick. For those of you who see three, there are three, by the way. There's finished, files, and scientific. But there are three more. There are actually six Fs in this four-sentence document. <laughs> I need eye surgery, not fair. Uh, so where they are is the of, the of, and the of. And if you feel silly at this point, don't worry. It's not an intelligence test. It just to demonstrate how easy it is to miss something. <laughs> Got me again. All right, um, why am I showing you this? Well, think about this. This is as easy as it gets. You are objectively looking at something for the first time. You don't know what it says, so you're not reading ahead. You're just looking for Fs, and you can still miss something, as obvious as these three Fs. Imagine your application, imagine your resume you already know what it should say. You've lived it for your entire career. You are completely not objective, and it's really hard to read it. You're too close to it. That's what we call it. You're too close to it before you even start reading it or writing it. And by the time you've done it you know, for a week and tried to get it, you're so sick of your resume that you don't even want to look at it. So this is a great opportunity to, again, utilize the career force location or your friends and family or your references and ask them to just proofread your resume. They'll find errors that you never dreamed. They will not understand sentences that make perfect sense to you because they're reading it for the first time. I highly recommend that you get more people involved in your job search. The more people that are involved in your job search, the more people who are advocating and the better you're networking. And one great way of bringing people into a job search is asking for a resume review. All right. so. I, I see a question coming up about this. Reason for leaving your job, and we'll, we'll deal with specific reasons or answers or questions in just a minute here. But for now, you want to choose the best language possible. If you were fired, that's, think about just saying that. If you were fired from a job, me just saying that has an emotional response. I mean, it gives you an emotional response because very few people, if anyone, enjoys being fired. But it happens to a lot of great people. Okay, so good people are fired every day. Many people deal with a firing in their, uh, in their job search. And by the way, the higher the position I have found, um, it's the mid-level that, that generally is safer from, from firing. I'm not saying it's safe because many mid-level um, jobs are fired, but I, every CEO I've ever met of any company has been fired multiple times. And the reason is because the expectations are so much higher and there's so many things out of their control, they get fired and they get jobs. And the reason they get jobs that next one is because they're talking about the good things that happen and they're not focusing on that very, very emotional negative thing that happened. So on your application, at least, the, the way I handle it is involuntary separation. The more detail you go into with a true firing, the worse it is for you because then you're trying to explain why you were fired. You're putting uh, judgments on the validity of the firing. And I'm not saying that in any one case, it could totally be not be your fault and you could be have a horrible employer. That doesn't matter what the reality is. What matters is how they see you on a paper. They see you as someone who is holding a grudge or vindictive or not accepting or whatever. Um, only do what helps you. And what helps you in this case is to tell the truth. It was an involuntary separation. So I did see a specific question on that uh, related to COVID, Robin, and it kind of flew up the chat before I was able to see it. Do you, do you have that copied and pasted to your question uh, queue? 
Uh, yeah, it says, when asked why I left my last job, I lost my job due to the pandemic. I have heard in interviews, they have heard that a lot. Yeah. Do you have a suggestion to make my job loss come across differently? Okay. Um, again, um, and I will do the best I can in this situation, but again, it's a great, great opportunity to reach out to your local career force location, not for a resume review, but to ask that very specific question. You know, and, and know what you want to get out of that, you know, one-to-one -one session and saying that here's everything. You know, here's, here's the, the whole, you know, a long story, which you don't want to tell. And then you boil it down to what helps you. So if you're hearing that everyone's saying that, think about, there probably been some people who have been fired who are saying, oh, it was COVID, that's why. Um, it's, it's kind of a catch-all. And as an employer, you probably would get tired of hearing that. So you, what you could say is, something, an example could be. Um, due to the, the pandemic, we ended up losing 50% of our customer base. We had to reduce hours. Therefore, um, the people with the, the least seniority were let go, and I happened to be within that group. I'm not putting any emotion into it, but I'm giving enough detail that you can buy it and then say, oh, yeah, that's a legitimate reason. You, you're, you're proving to me why, and now let's move on. Because the reason you were let go is not the reason I'm going to hire you, but it might be the reason I don't hire you. You know, so think about, is there enough information to answer the question? And then you stop and you don't place blame, even if there's completely blame to be placed, because in, in many cases that ends an interview when, when you go on uh, and talk about it. And in fact, uh, I've counseled many job seekers who have lost a lot of opportunities because they kept making the same mistake. And that was, they were throwing their former employer under the bus. Um, now, that COVID response is exactly the same um, advice as I would give for a layoff, which in many cases, what, you know, a COVID layoff is a layoff. Uh, and the reason is many people who are fired will say they were laid off. And I, a little bit more information will allow me to accept that and move on. Now, if it was not your choice, if you resigned, it was a voluntary separation, you know, you still have to explain that a little bit too. Uh, at interview, because they might ask you. Um, if it was a relocation because of your family move, you know, those are, are details that answer the question. But if you just say, I quit, as an employer, I'm wondering, well, will you quit this job? So I might need a little bit more information. All right, before we move on to portfolios, uh, we'll take a couple more questions and then we'll wrap up. Alrighty, I'm going to go back a little bit and get and grab a couple that were asked a while ago. So, thank you for your patience, Art. How do you feel about strength fi strength finders? I'm interested in strength finders as uh, in terms of how I could use it to drive my job search. Okay, so um, I, I'm I'm going to speak directly to uh, I, I believe the product you're talking about is Strength Finder 2.0. Um, that is a a book you can buy from Barnes and Noble or Amazon or whatever. And you read through it. It's a very small book. I think back I got one right in front of me, Art. It's okay. discovery. It's uh, it's <laughs> now been rebranded. Just so you guys know, it is now referred to as Clifton Strengths, okay. um, written by a gentleman named Don Clifton, and it's associated with the Gallup people. And I can get you a link in here as Art is talking. By the way, we're not selling anything. Uh, the reason we're mentioning it is many people run into this at some point in their career. I've run into it three times. One of my coworkers has done it six times. It's a very easy buy for, uh, you know, to, to give to all your, uh, your group. They all take this assessment and it finds out what your strengths are. And then you, the idea is you work towards your strengths rather, rather than overcoming a weakness. You build on a strength um, and, and to the benefit of your employer and yourself. Now, you may agree with that or not agree with that. You may agree with personality profiles or not. I still find value in them, and the reason is other people find value in them. So um, I've actually used StrengthFinder 2.0 in an interview, and the reason I did it was it was a shared experience. When I went into the manager's office, I, I looked at their bookshelf, and I always look at what's hanging on the wall, what's on the bookshelf, and I saw this very, you know, millions of prints of this StrengthFinder 2.0. And while we're doing the little chit chat in the beginning of that kind of get to know you, I said, oh, Strength Finder 2.0, I took that last year. What were your strengths or what, what, do we do, what were you labeled as? And it'll be something like, you'll get like five characteristics or four and it'll be like um, intellectual wisdom, woo, uh, pleaser or something like that. And what it does is it creates this, oh, you've done something I've done. 
Um, and a smile comes across their face because it's a shared experience. And for me, it just made the interview easier. Uh, the other part of that is any personality profile you take or anything like that is largely more and more becoming part of the application process. Uh, places like United Healthcare will do a personality profile or screening as part of the application. And if you've never done one before, um, you may not know how, to, how they work. You know, you want to answer truthfully, and many people will answer with the way they think they should answer, which will trip you up later on down the road. So I do believe in taking them because employers believe in them. Let's take one more question before we get to portfolios. By the way, Art, just to know, I, I teach or, or taught a strengths finder class here at Brooklyn Park. I had a woman comment um, after class once. She said, you know, Robin, she said I was fired from my job. And she said, after taking this class, I'm still kind of angry about it, but I totally see now why I didn't fit in with the team because they were all this type and I was a different type. So it gave her a little empathy to what the reality of her situation was. Okay, so I'm going to combine two questions for you, Art, because they're similar. Um, one person says, what is the best way to present skills on a resume? I've seen them listed in one section. Uh, sometimes they're on a graphic. Sometimes they're mixed into responsibilities and achievements. The second part of the question are to keep in mind is somebody else asked, um, where do, how do you deal with specific skills in the about section on LinkedIn? So resume, LinkedIn, okay. how do you deal with it? Oh, okay, let's break that down. First off, <laughs> Have fun with it, Art. It, it, as far as the resume, where do you put them? It depends on what you've done in relation to what the needs of the, the current um, targeted audience is. So if I have uh, been within a management situation for the last 10 years and now I want a management job, those skills would be interspersed within your chronological work history. Okay, so um, if you have relevant and recent work history, the best resume that I have found, the template that I've used is a chronological, and that's the standard, you know, just listing of jobs and what you did there. And the reason is I want to see what you've done recently that relates to the type of work I want you to do. It just is easy to get a buy-in from employers. Now, for transferable skills or skills that you're trying to paint a picture for an employer, so let's say, yeah, I was in this industry, but here's what I'm taking out of that industry to meet your needs. Uh, job titles are not going to do that. So you want to use a functional or skills-based resume um, where you list the skill set and then you put bulleted points of examples under that skill set. Three to five, three to five examples. You don't have to put everything, and, and you can combine some skills within the bulleted points too. I mean, there's a lot of flexibility there. And then at the bottom, you, you'd put your work history just as line items. So the work history wouldn't be the focus, it would be the proof of where you develop those skill sets. As far as LinkedIn, we'll be speaking specifically about this in a couple of weeks, but LinkedIn is, think of it as a portfolio, kind of like the, the portfolio I'm going to talk about now, but it's your online portfolio. It's a it's a, um, not a portfolio, it's a, um, I'm trying to think of the name. It's what everybody sees. So you don't have the ability to speak directly to any given audience, but it's what you want everyone to see you as. So you can't say, I've done all these, you know, incredible things at all these different industries because that creates a, a very confusing overall impression. So think about the type of work you're looking for now. And the beauty of LinkedIn is it's not all about job titles. I mean, you have that, you know, that introductory statement where you can even go a little bit more narrative. You can speak a little longer than you would in a resume because when people look at your LinkedIn account, you have a captive audience. They're there to find out more about you. They're not, in many cases, in most cases, you know, clicking on account after account after account. The only reason they're at your LinkedIn account is because you've already created interest with your resume or they're going to interview you. Now you can tell a more narrative story um, that's backed up by your employment history. So you can still use keywords, but they're not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend adjusting your LinkedIn account for every interview you go on. Um, now where this gets tricky is when you're going for a couple different types of work. Uh, maybe you want to be a bartender, but you also want to do some data entry. Well, think about who are you going to market your LinkedIn page to. If you're marketing to the data entry side of it, then you can speak directly to that. You just don't give the LinkedIn account to the, the bartender side uh, of, of who you're marketing yourself to. They can still find it, of course, and you have to make a determination on whether you want that out there. Uh, but it's a little trickier, but it's 
think about it as it's a general overview towards a specific industry, not a specific employer. All right, uh, we'll get through the portfolios and then we'll wrap up. Uh, real quickly, the reason I include portfolios in this is it's a takeaway. Even if you don't give it to an employer, I bring it to every interview. I, I brought it and not had an opportunity to give it to them. But I've also been in a um, interview where it absolutely sealed the deal for me. I've hired people because of their portfolios. Now, again, they were already at interviews, so I mean, they had a lot going for them at that point, but it was the deciding factor. What you include in this is several copies of your resume, in case they don't have them, and that happens more often than you think, a copy of your cover letter, several copies. I always bring 10. I know that seems silly, but I've been in panel interviews with six people when I didn't anticipate it. I thought it was going to be one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one. -on -one. Um, so I always bring 10 copies. Uh, your reference sheet. At, at Most employers don't check your references until they interview you. So even though you might have put it on the application, I include it on a separate sheet. Uh, letters of recommendation are always beneficial. Work samples. If you say that you do marketing, give me an example of it. If you say that you're really good at putting together a report off an Excel spreadsheet, give me an example of it. Of course, you're going to have to redact or remove any information that would be you know, personal, but um, work samples prove something that you're otherwise just saying. And then also copies of certificates or licensures. If you're a special engineer boiler operator, I'm going to have to get that information at some point from you. And if you give it to me at interview, oh my gosh, that's one thing I don't have to ask for. I've already got it. Um, so portfolios have a benefit of showing you as organized and as thoughtful. However, something to keep in mind, make sure you brand all the information that you put in there. So in this example, if I have a somewhat well-formatted resume here, they're going to see that format and they're going to say, oh, that looks pretty nice. And then if the cover letter looks like this, I've lost all of that because I assume that someone helped you with this resume, here's the skills I'm actually getting on the cover letter. So spend the extra time to brand your references, your resume, and your cover letter to look the same. Now think about that. This and this are the exact same information, but because it's branded to present this um, consistent look, it has a better impression in most cases. All right. I did kind of cruise through that because I wanted to keep, leave a couple minutes just in case there were some extra questions hanging out there. And Robin, I'll just leave the last two minutes for you to ask those. Okay. So um, one thing that somebody asked, and I, I did reach out to this person privately and said, talk to me because I've, I've done this. But um, Art, you may want to weigh in on this. Is it possible to attach audio and video files? to the resume. So I think a broader question here, Art, is um, what is the what are some good ways of displaying skills um, through uh, techno means? You like okay. that? Techno means? Yeah, techno means. Okay. <laughs> so um, not every job would allow for this, obviously. Um, uh, some jobs would, they would ask you to do it in a work sample interview where you would actually demonstrate that. However, uh, if you, you know, have a special talent you can actually send, in some cases, a work sample as part of your, you know, uh, introductory. You know, I'm very excited to to take part in the interview next week. Um, here's a link to a couple of the presentations I've done. Uh, one of the things I did was um, there was a Prezi, it's called. It's a kind of like a, a very fancy PowerPoint presentation, but it's online. And sometimes I'll send an employer a link to that presentation. So you know, if they have the time, they can look at it. I couldn't do that during the interview, so I'm giving them extra information. Uh, you want to make it as simple as possible. I would recommend against uh, doing any like Google Docs that, that are, might be protected in a way. Uh, online links are generally better, but there will be some uh, reluctance to click on a link that they're not, you know, assured that it, is, that it doesn't have viruses on there. And, and Robin, I know you, you have some specific examples you probably will um, be able to give that that person in that particular question. Yeah, um, absolutely. So uh, you reach out to me and, and I'll help you from there. Okay. Uh, at this point, we are at time. Um, everyone will receive, like I said, the, uh, the follow-up material. Really appreciate you starting our day with us. Thank you so much. Um, if you have taken this class as part of an unemployment uh, session and a requirement, I do take attendance, however, I can't mark that on your account. So what you would do is you would log into your unemployment account 
and just put today's date in the creative job search category. You only have to take one of the sessions to complete that requirement. However, we, we're, we're here for, for four more sessions and we'd love to have you. Thank you everybody. I hope you have an awesome day and the best of luck to you in your job search.